Thank you, Kristen. Um, so Luke and I were talking the other day about how this is not the kind of conference we normally present at. So most of the conferences I present at have a bunch of people who have been web developers for years hunched over their laptops in their hoodies. So this is a different kind of, <laughs> different kind of conference. Um, but I think in seriousness, it's, it's good that we're here because there's an opportunity for a lot of cross-pollination. So I've heard a lot of things this morning and over uh, dinner last night. It just reminded me about the, the things where we, there's lots of parallels and places where folks are thinking about ideas in ways that are different than what I, kind of, what I do. I'm gonna try to keep this talk not too techy. Um, Luke yesterday pointed out a number of places where I assumed knowledge that I was like, everybody knows that, right? Um, so if you don't understand anything, just feel free to ask questions at the end. So as uh, Sarah and Steve made clear earlier today in some of their presentations, it's retail uh, and mobile, it's not just about e-commerce, it's also about, um, which is a portion of retail, but not uh, more than around 10% I hear, um, it's also about the in-store experience. So I wanted to walk you through sort of how we think about technology uh, and how it can help in these spaces. So I think uh, historically, I want to start with the history of, uh, of the web. So the web grew up on desktop. You had beefy machines, you were plugged into the uh, power, so you didn't have to worry about battery life. Uh, you had a fast, always-on connection. And in that space, the web was really revolutionary because it helped uh, like users get and access uh, businesses in a way that they couldn't do before with much, much, much lower friction. You didn't have to drive to the store. You didn't even have to install any software. You just opened up your browser, you clicked the link, and you were there. And that low friction is pretty key. I think we forget about it today, but it's, it's something that's still incredibly critical to a lot of businesses online. So then, flash forward to the first iPhone, um, and at the beginning, everyone thought that the web was gonna do the same thing on mobile. It's gonna be the same basic thing, just on a smaller device uh, that had battery, uh, you know, more of a limited CPU, and that kind of thing. Um, in fact, the first iPhone, the, first, the way to build apps for it was uh, actually web apps. But that didn't last for too long. Um, and as everybody knows now, mobile is all about apps, right? It's all about having um, an app for that for everything. Now, I'm biased. Obviously, I work on browsers and have for uh, eight or so years now. Um, but I think that's not the entire picture. I think there's a lot more that's going on in this space. So. Forgive the abstract diagram here, but I, this is a way I think about this problem. So on the uh, y-axis, you have value. This is more of like the abstract value that users get from interacting with businesses that they want to interact with and buy things from, and that businesses get from users who interact with them. And on the uh, x-axis, you've got users, organized by how engaged they want to be with your business. So at the very far left is people who click the link to your site accidentally, said, oops, bounced, and never came back. And on the very far right is the president of your fan club. And ideally, you want people to move up this curve over time. As they interact with your business, they want to become more and more engaged to a higher level. And it's also a relatively smooth curve. But if you look at this with native apps, I think this is the area that people, that it actually covers. Your most engaged users are the ones who come back, they engage a whole lot in these really rich native app experiences. But of course, this is only one portion of the larger space. There's all this other gray area, users who want to engage with you but aren't able to in that space. Because with apps, you have this do or die moment. Is the user gonna install my app or are they not? And there's a lot of people that don't necessarily want to install your app. Um, it's a big commitment. It takes up space on your phone, it takes up a slot on your home screen. And it turns out there are lots of users who just don't want to do it. So, uh, if you don't have a, a use case where users want to come to your site uh, weekly or, or daily, they might just not want to come to your site. So we've seen a bunch of funnels like this. Uh, we talk about this a lot in the, the sort of technology space. We know that some people will come to our apps uh, and that they, they're going to drop out at some point in the funnel. So they'll come to our site, they'll tap a banner uh, over to go to the Play Store or the App Store, they'll decide to, to uh, install it, they'll wait for it to install. At every point, you're losing people in this funnel. And if you look, it's very context dependent, but if you look at different stages in this funnel, you generally see that the percent that actually make it through that stage is uh, low single digits and maybe at the highest 20%. So for example, uh, Google Plus did a, released a case study a few years ago and showed that uh, if users came to the site, they saw a full screen interstitial that said, hey, go get the app. And only 9% of users clicked through that. And that's actually pretty high in the industry. And the other thing that's actually very misleading about this sort of classic chart is these steps compound. If you fall out of the first stage of the funnel, you don't make it to the second stage. 
Um, so those low numbers actually multiply like crazy. So this actually is much more realistic in terms of what uh, the number of users who are getting through your funnel. So if you look at this original graph, it's actually more like this in terms of the value that you're creating. Um, so, which isn't that big in the grand scheme of things, obviously. And if you're Facebook, maybe this part of the graph is pretty big. But if you aren't Facebook, it's probably somewhat small. And also, for many businesses, if users don't interact with you all that often, you might not have any space that people really want to install that app in, in general. So if you sell couches, that's your primary thing, people don't buy a couch every week. And so that's not necessarily that they're gonna wanna come back uh, to that experience. Um, there's tons of missing value here, but luckily the web never went away on mobile. And so it's possible to build experiences that reach many users with that low friction, but historically they haven't been great, um, right? Users come to them, they don't engage all that much. And part of the reason is because I think a lot of businesses take their desktop web app and they just shrink it down to the mobile, to the mobile space. And they say, yeah, we got a web app. People come to it, they don't really use it that much, I guess, on mobile, that's just how it works, I guess. And they kind of give up. But this picture does not feel right to me. There's so much value that's being left on the table for users and for businesses. It, it can't just be that you have a small number of highly engaged users and a whole bunch of people in kind of this wasteland. So when I think about what makes apps special, I think one thing that's really important that people don't think too much about is that when you invest in an app, you don't just shrink down your desktop experience. You really have to think from the ground up, what does the user actually want to do in this context, in this moment? Because on desktop, it's way more goal-directed. I want to buy a couch, I'm going to go research, open up a bunch of tabs, figure out what I want to do, uh, then maybe search for prices, and then ultimately purchase. But on mobile, it's very different. People are generally on their devices in sort of this found time. Time that, I don't know what people did decades ago, to be quite honest, uh, because it seemed like it would be really boring, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, but you, you know, even in the home, you have people who are watching TV and looking at their mobile devices. At Starbucks, you place an order for a coffee, you got maybe three minutes or so, you pull out your phone, you're like, mm, Pinterest. Um, or in the taxi, when you're just trying to kill time and focus on, uh, try not to focus on how scary it is uh, driving through city traffic sometimes. Um, so in these contexts, if you're trying to sell couches, the, re the way to do it is not to try to get the conversion right there at that moment when someone's just waiting for their coffee. That's probably not gonna happen. It's more about um, helping people be inspired by, by uh, the types of things they wanna uh, buy. So be able to immerse and say, oh, that's really interesting. I hadn't really thought about that particular style or how these different types of furniture could go along together. And I think that this is really important. Uh, it's the critical thing. It's the reason about your user in the context uh, and in the moment that they're actually reaching you in the way they want to uh, engage with you. And luckily, this is not app specific. You can do this on your sites, mobile websites as well. So I think a number of folks, as they've invested in this, they've seen that just by being really thoughtful about the way that they approach uh, this value, they can have a, a much more immersive, much, much, much more engaging experience. It doesn't have to be this wasteland. Um, but there's still this missing value, there's still this gray portion that web just can't do. And so a few years ago, a number of browser vendors and, uh, and us, we got together and we tried to solve this problem and figure out what that missing piece was. And there's three, there's three major pieces. The first is connectivity. So on desktop, you always had a connection. You didn't have to worry about the, uh, you know, the data dropping. But on mobile, you are constantly on the go in different conditions. So, People are like, oh no, I, I have LTE. All my customers are premium customers, they've got LTE. But that doesn't mean that much because radio waves are influenced by metal and buildings and all kinds of stuff. So as you're walking down the street, you're coming in and out of connectivity. And if you're in an app, you generally have all the resources locally so that when you tap, it just kind of loads a little bit more slowly. But on web, when you tap and you don't have connectivity, you see an error page, effectively. You see this offline dinosaur. You feel like you fell off the edge of the, of the internet. And that's not a great experience. The next one is push notifications. Push notifications, when they came out, were kind of uh, this interesting novelty that was great for chat applications. But it turns out that having timely information on the go that's, that you can react to is perfect for people in those contexts. And so push notifications really are just a part of a, the fabric of uh, what users expect in a mobile experience. And the last one is, it seems kind of silly, but people really don't like typing on mobile. Uh, it's just more of a pain. 
So if I'm sitting there at Starbucks and I've got three minutes, even if I would really love to go to Washington Post right now, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna open up my phone and go, hmm, Pinterest. Even though, had Washington Post been there as an option to fall back into, I might have chosen that, which would, would have been great for Washington Post and great for me. So we, tackled, we talked about a lot of these. In this space, standards take a long time. So it's been, I think, four or five years that we've been working with uh, Mozilla and Microsoft and Samsung and Opera and many others. And the good news is that we've actually brought solutions in terms of new web standards for all of these. So I'm not gonna go into the details about uh, what exactly these are, words like service workers or add to home screen or, or web push notifications. The point is though that these are optional. So you can build the best experience you want for your users in the context they are. And if they come to you in a browser that supports these new web standards, you can just make that experience much better. So that's, of course, surprise, the missing piece, uh, that missing value that historically has not been possible to get. One thing that's really important about this is you notice there's a few jumps that are kind of discontinuities. And that represents the notion of, say someone's buying that couch, uh, they've decided after a long time they've been inspired on multiple in desktop, in person, maybe they've seen it in your retail store, uh, and they're like, I want to purchase right now, and it's out of stock. So they don't want to install your app, it's way too much commitment, but if it says, hey, do you want to get notified when this couch comes back in stock? Sure, that sounds right. So that's an opportunity to create more engagement with that user in a way that's good for everybody. So these are jumps that are very difficult to get if you have to convince them to go all the way to app. So you can have a much smoother gradation and build that relationship with users over time. So I think this is a bit of a paradigm shift in terms of what we can do now. Uh, on desktop, historically, about a decade ago, there was another paradigm shift. This is the word that Luke said really, <laughs> wouldn't necessarily know, but it, we, we called it Ajax. Um, it was this notion of building the best possible web experience you could, just that users would understand and expect a much more rich experience. And I think the same thing is happening on mobile. And we call it progressive web apps. So it's really about redefining the, what modern mobile web development means. It means holding yourself to a much higher standard, thinking through very carefully the user experience, what users want to actually engage with you in the context, in the moment, in the place that they come to interact with you. And then of course, uh, in places that have these new web standards like Chrome, Firefox, Soon, Edge, uh, and other browsers, giving them an even better experience in that. So, We've seen across the world in the past year or so, basically in every vertical, we see have a great example of a progressive web app. Uh, in every market around the world, we've seen uh, examples of these. In some markets, like India, basically every vertical has uh, one of their major players has built a progressive web app. In the United States, uh, folks like Forbes, Washington Post, Lyft, and most recently Twitter have shipped progressive web apps, and many more of them are on the way. And just uh, a couple weeks ago, Gartner released a report talking about how important they were. And when you look at the, how these actually impact users, across the board, in every one that we've looked at, the numbers are pretty big. So this is Alibaba, which is an e-commerce uh, player. And this is just one of the examples. We've got about 13 or 14 case studies published. And we see lots of companies are publishing their own case studies. They're just so excited by the numbers that they're seeing. Um, and we're seeing, again, this huge engagement, this lift in conversions, in engagement, and time spent, just capturing more of that value for users. Uh, and it makes sense, right? Just by focusing on building the best experience you can, there's a lot more that you can do as opposed to just shrinking your desktop site down. So the reason I'm up here with Luke is because West Elm is a great example of a retailer who's on the forefront of thinking through this. And so they've recently uh, are, are rethinking how their mobile experience works and are building an awesome progressive web app. So he's gonna tell you more about it. Um. Thanks, Alex. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having us here. Uh, I will sort of reiterate what Alex said, which is sort of funny. I'm used to speaking at tech con uh, conferences as well. So I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to sort of uh, merge all the thinking and all the, the work that I've done from the digital space into the retail world and hopefully make uh, not only the retail space a better place, but also uh, specifically the mobile web. Um, I also have to have a shout out for Alex, too, because he said he was going to be up here for 16 minutes. And I think he was 15.45. So that was oh. pretty incredible, I have to say. That's, uh, mind blowing. I have no idea how long mine's going to take. So uh, <laughs> that's why I was second. Didn't have to worry about that stuff. Um, so first and foremost, let me ask everybody, uh, show of hands, I can sort of see people. How many people know uh, who West Elm is and what we do? 
Okay, good. So I don't have to do any explaining. Um, West Elm is a home furnishings good. When uh, Alex is talking about a couch, I mean, he's, he's definitely talking about sort of our use case and our scenarios that we see with our clients and consumers. Um, we're part of the Pottery Barn and Williams Sonoma family. Um, and over the last uh, couple years, 2015, 2016, like pretty much everybody, we saw massive traffic growth across our mobile devices. Um, we also saw, alongside that, thankfully, uh, massive mobile revenue growth. And that even occurred in some places where it was probably unexpected. Um, a lot of people didn't think anyone would ever buy a couch on a phone. A lot of people didn't think anyone would ever buy a car on a phone. Uh, and, and these types of things are happening. Um, we know that they're happening across a variety of places. Um, sometimes it's that final piece of inspiration where you are talking with your significant other and you say, you know what, let's just do it. And you happen to be out at a restaurant and you click the button. Sometimes that happens when you're actually in store. I actually start to think of mobile devices and mobile sites specifically as becoming sort of the next mobile POS, uh, something that you know, your customers are actually using on their own uh, and bringing that forward. Um, but alongside all this revenue and traffic increases we've seen, we really, we really only saw a modest increase in conversion rates on mobile. Um, and, and we actually think that that's probably a, a, a pretty large place where we can influence um, our spend as well as uh, effectively bring in, uh, as everybody has talked about, the millennial generation uh, into the fold in a better way. And all these factors sort of coming together have created a really great opportunity for us um, to basically uh, experiment with, uh, build, uh, and hopefully put forth a more engaging and um, obviously hopefully a higher converting um, mobile site across the, the entire web and, and across all devices. And really, this became a, a pretty core component for, for West Elm as a whole. Um, we have this pretty strong um, idea that we want to create the best experience for our users, no matter where they are in our ecosystem. And we wanted to do that on the mobile web in a more specific way. So like all good companies, uh, we had a meeting, right? <laughs> and we all started talking a little about what should we be doing on the mobile web. Um, we talked about a variety of factors. Uh, one of the things that we traditionally had never done in the past was actually create a native application. Um, we have some for some of our more secondary stuff like registry, but, but not a holistic native application for everything on our site. Um, and at the end of the day, we decided that it really wasn't right for us. Um, people don't buy a couch every day. Uh, you know, I go on Facebook or Instagram every day, but, but that's the use case that's happening on, on my native applications, things that I'll download to my phone itself. And so what we started to realize was we had this like, great uh, desktop site here. And, and as I mentioned, you know, we have sort of multiple touch points with all our users. And we want to amplify and make those the best they can be. Um, we know people touch us on desktop and mobile and on social and on email and in-store. Um, and, and our goal really is to sort of unify all of those different channels in this entire customer conversion funnel. But also really the point is to create the best possible experience that we can for each user no matter what they're doing. If they're speaking to an associate in-store, we want that to be a top rate uh, experience. If they're looking at a couch on a mobile device, we want that to be the best possible experience they can have. And so we started to, to, to really think about this and, and also put our mobile site that we currently have up there as well. Um, and we started to, to think about this, okay, if we want to create the best, the best possible mobile experience for our customers, we have to take a truly mobile first approach. Now, everybody throws around the word mobile first, or maybe even you've heard people say mobile only when they talk about digital uh, in e-com. But no one does it. It's so frustrating to me uh, as someone who's really grown up with, with the mobile web and, and, and really loves it and uses it every day that as much as we talk about using it, we actually really do what Alex said, which is we take our desktop sites and we sort of cram them into this smaller experience. And so we started to ask ourselves, you know, what are the most important aspects um, for our mobile users? And, and also, how are they actually using their mobile devices today? And we really feel, started to feel that, like, when we went out and looked at ourselves as well as other retail organizations, that no one was actually tackling the mobile web in the correct way. Um, at least not the way that all of our consumers and all of our users are actually using their mobile devices. And we realized, obviously, that we don't just want a downside version of our site. Um, we want an experience, like I said, that's, that's best for whatever device. So we started by basically stripping everything back. We had this, this great site that you can sort of see up here. Um, and that's our traditional mobile website that, that, that you'll currently see if you go to westom.com on a mobile device. Um, and basically, we decided we're going to build the best possible uh, mobile experience for all of our users. And of course, uh, I wouldn't be up here today if we had been like, oh my god, we're building a native app. Of course. What we did was we actually moved forward with building a progressive web app. And we found as we started to build this and as we started to get in the weeds that we could create a really visual, really immersive experience that could actually elevate our brand uh, and our products 
um, but would also have a really heavy focus on speed, uh, both initial load times and subsequent load times, um, and would allow our, our users not only to transact, obviously that's massively important, we want uh, convergence on our mobile site, but as Alex is talking about, we also wanted people to be able to explore. Um, so we basically uh, took a lot of those ideas that we we're seeing on, on different um, sort of native applications, uh, social applications, and we brought those to the forefront in our progressive web app on the mobile web. Um, we brought a lot of different um, sort of awesome capabilities, you know, things like uh, infinite scrolling, uh, touch-based uh, gestures and navigation, um, visual icons, um, all these sort of great things that you see in traditional native applications, but you don't see. I mean, go to any <laughs> retail site out there. I was actually just on, uh, I was looking for a new pair of hiking boots. I've been planning on doing some hiking, and, and I was shocked. I couldn't even swipe on the, the pictures of the, the retail site I was on. I had to actually click this tiny little arrow in the corner, like, that's not how we're using these mobile uh, applications. And another reason we went down the progressive web app tunnel is because of all the great reasons that Alex mentioned. Um, we knew that with the new mobile standards that are coming out um, and, and the new additional capabilities that we were able to build into, that we'd be able to add all these really wonderful things, uh, things like add to home screen, things like web push notifications, things that were once only reserved sort of for native applications now have the capability of being utilized and brought to consumers across the mobile web. And what we wanted to do is we didn't want to just build for today. We actually were really trying to future-proof and, and, and think about what the future mobile web will look like. Um, and, and all of these reasons are really what, what sort of baked into us deciding to go through it forward with the Progressive Web App. And there's, there's been a little bit of trepidation, I think, around Progressive Web Apps. One of the things um, that's happening is Safari as a browser is a little bit behind the times. Um, Alex is, uh, <laughs> I know, talks to them very uh, consistently. Um, and I know there's, they've been a, doing a lot of you know, different components to agree to some of these great new mobile standards that we're moving forward with. But the really amazing part is that the Progressive Web App that we built looks unbelievable on both Safari and iOS and on Android and on Chrome and on Firefox. Any browser or device that you're actually using out there, this is going to look amazing. Now, the browsers that support some of these greater functionalities and capabilities, um, like I said, like add to home screen and push notification, we're actually going to take advantage of those on those devices and provide an even better experience. And so our thought and our hope and our dream is that progressive web apps uh, can actually get us to a place where in the past only native applications were able to take us. And, of course, the biggest benefit alongside that of having that great usability and user experience is that the web itself is actually um, discoverable. Uh, and that's, that's the really big key here, too. We want to have that really amazing user experience, but as Alex chart sort of shows you, but, but also able to connect to all those individuals that are sort of in that gray area um, where they're not getting that best experience or they're not able to find your actual um, site or application. And so let's take a little bit of look, uh, a little look at what we're actually building right now. So I'll walk you guys through a little bit of the browsing functionality right here. Um, you can actually see one of the core tenets of what we did was focus heavily on speed um, but also very heavily on making it very visual and very immersive, using lifestyle content to actually bring our brand to the forefront and try and make something beautiful that would also load um, also on, on sort of worse or older devices and poor network connections itself. And when our users actually navigate from our product feed, which you can see that's what we're scrolling through right here, our product feed, um, and then they actually click into our product pages, which was that click right there, you're going to have to let it run through again because it, 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 it happened so fast. I actually was showing off our first prototype of this to the board of directors, uh, and I had to run through the, right there, there it was, we had to run through the, uh, the click from our product feed into our product page um, because it happened so quick. And for me, uh, this is like mind blowing. Um, usually every time you click into a product, you get that full white screen, everything reloads, the bar goes across the top, and then all of a sudden you're presented with an image. For us, it happens right here. You're gonna see it right on this, that's it, right there. Now you're into the product page instantaneously. And I actually had to slow this down at the board of directors and walk them through it multiple times because no one really believed that I was actually able, to, or we were able to actually build something like this. Um, and it's one of those things where we actually started thinking about ways to slow down our site or, or uh, at least identify to people that stuff had happened. And, and I've built a lot of digital products across the, my life, and I've never thought to myself, man, I've got to think of new ways to slow my site down. That's <laughs> never, ever been something I thought of. So it's been a little bit interesting. I um, mean, as I mentioned earlier, um, you can see we took a lot of cues from social. This has a very Instagram looking feel. You can see the navigation, icon based navigation across the top that scrolls horizontally. Um, we took a lot of these capabilities and we wanted to bring them um, forward in a really uh, unique and, and beautiful way. 
And the great part is we didn't sacrifice anything um, by moving to a progressive web app. Uh, you're still able to search actually even faster than our current site does. Um, you can still add to cart. You can still check out. Um, and of course, it works seamlessly across all browsers and devices. And on Android and, and some of the more uh, uh, forward-thinking um, web browsers, we actually were able to take advantage of a couple of those uh, key components that Alex mentioned that can bring us sort of the next frontier of mobile web. Um, this is the add home screen sort of demonstration. And what you can see here is that uh, very quickly and very easily, uh, while a user is browsing your site, and this is something that happens um, you know, when uh, after they've visited multiple times or after a certain amount of time on site, um, they'll actually get prompted with a, a basically a, a notification on screen. And you can see it right there. It just says add to home screen. Uh, the user clicks that button, and instantaneously an icon is placed on their home screen. Now that's really important. Um, that's really important as a, as a retailer um, because I can get an icon directly on a user's screen and get really valuable screen space so that when they do return to try and kill some time when they're in line at the bank or waiting for their mocha latte frappuccino or whatever <laughs> it is you drink at Starbucks, um, they can find uh, that icon and they can very easily and quickly tap it and get into that experience. Now, as you guys probably can tell, there's no Play Store involved, there's no App Store, there's no, no iTunes, I'm not directing them off my site to some other third party. This is happening directly on your mobile site. Um, and what's also really beautiful about this is that it's sort of the holy grail, right? It's like we've always been looking for a seamless, one-touch integration to get our content on users' devices, and, and here it is. And, and I, I was saying earlier, it's no stores, it's no downloads, it's no friction. It's what the mobile web was here to do, and we're bringing it to life in a, in a much more robust way. And the great part is once the user has that icon on their home screen, they can actually open up uh, your mobile website uh, in a full screen view. Um, and I think this is very beautiful, not only because of that idea of like if I'm killing time, I immediately can tap, I don't have to type in your URL, I don't have to think about it. Uh, but also because if you guys can sort of notice it here, it actually eliminates the pesky sort of top URL bar, um, which always rests along the top of your mobile browsing experience and sort of cuts out like 20-ish pixels, which is not much in the grand scheme of things, but it's a, it's a pretty big deal when you talk to your designers and the people that are actually building these sites. And so, at the end of the day, the goal for us, and, and really the beauty here was that we were able to create a first-in-class experience, one that's protected from the future of the mobile web and even sets us up for greater wins down the line, um, but is also incredibly fast, um, brings together all these different sort of social use case and attribution capabilities that we're, we're all used to using and sort of browsing on our mobile devices, and all uh, in a way that's, that's very real and very ready for today's mobile web. And, and honestly, I have to say we're super excited about our early results. Um, we've done a bunch of user testing on this over the, uh, over the past few weeks and months, uh, and we're actually going to be launching uh, another test. I was hoping it was going to be ready uh, for this conversation today, uh, but we're going to have that out hopefully in the next week or so. Uh, but the early results have, have been really great. We actually uh, did a lot of um, sort of qualitative testing on this before we started moving it into a, into a bigger testing arena. And the, the qualitative testing was mind blowing. Um, I was actually really excited to get all the feedback from our users. Uh, I think someone up here on the stage earlier said it's, it's not that hard to actually get uh, uh, feedback from users. They want to give it to you. They want to tell you uh, about what they think, um, how they think you should improve it, if they like what you're doing. Um, and, and that qualitative feedback was really the, the biggest spur on for us to make sure that we finalize some of the core competencies that we wanted to create. And they called out, thankfully, all of the really great things that, that we knew we were, or we hoped we were bringing sort of um, to their device. Um, they all called out the speed. Everyone loved that. Even the people that had uh, sort of older end devices, maybe things that weren't quite as, um, you know, a, a forward as, a, as an you know, I, the newest iOS running 10 and, and running the newest Safari. Um, people with old Android phones were really uh, captive uh, by what we were able to do for them. And then they also talked a lot about this idea of, of uh, being able to just constantly see the site and never have any ups and downs uh, with if it's loading or not. And that's a key component. Um, a lot of the different items that you saw on the examples I've shown you um, are all basically uh, have to do with offline browsing and caching capabilities. So all those things are actually on the device and in the browser itself. Uh, and therefore, every time uh, they hit a dead spot or they went through what a lot of people call Li-Fi, where you, you see the three bars, but you don't, it just spins and nothing happens. Um, <laughs> they weren't interrupted by that experience. And hopefully by the time they got to that next cell phone tower or by the time that Wi-Fi actually came back together, um, the, the, the site would just continue to load and they wouldn't actually lose anything there. 
And then the quantitative results have been, I mean, I, I actually didn't put any, uh, <laughs> I'll give you guys a little behind the scenes. I wasn't going to tell anyone. And Alex, I don't think knows this either. I actually didn't include any of our um, increases in conversion, pages, browser, revenue per visitors, because they were too good. Uh, <laughs> they were actually, like, I, it's like spring training stats. Is anyone a baseball fan? We're in Arizona, so hopefully everyone's a baseball fan. It's like spring training stats, you know? You want your player to do really well, but you can't really say, like, oh, he's going to be the next Mike Trout. Um, Mike Trout's an MVP winner if you don't know baseball. Um, <laughs> So, so, you know, but we did, we saw substantial increases in our mobile conversion rate, uh, leaps and bounds across what we normally see on our standard mobile app. Um, it, a, a massive increases in, in pages browsed. Um, a lot of that, I, I believe, has to do with the speed uh, and the capability that we're offering uh, our clients. They can very quickly jump into a product page, as I sort of tried to show you guys earlier, but it's hard to even see it on that. Um, then they can quickly jump back into the feed and keep browsing around and looking for more products. We have all sorts of ways to allow our users to actually explore further through within the app itself. I didn't even get into some of that, but our navigation structure is different. Um, we're allowing people to see more of the same product. We're doing all sorts of things to hopefully help them look at more products, compare more items, and hopefully be immersed in our experience in, in, in a more uh, substantial way. And then, of course, our revenue per visitor was up. And this is really the big metric that, that we're, um, um, you know, it's pretty important for us. Um, people were adding to cart in the same or greater amount that they are on our current site. Um, and they were checking out uh, in, a, in a much better way. And then I've also sort of weirdly in green put another down arrow, which usually you don't put down arrows in green, but uh, decrease in, uh, in load times across all devices. This is a pretty significant one. And, and to be honest with you guys, this is really the biggest piece that we set out to do originally. Um, you'll see these charts, and they're very correct. We actually looked at our own numbers uh, across over a year's worth of mobile data. Um, and for every about second, it is that your page loads after the three second mark, you lose 25% in conversion rate. And that was really what we, when we set out down this path and when we really decided on progressive web apps, it was because we knew we could create a really great experience, but we felt that we could also basically move forward uh, with incredible load times, uh, both initial and subsequent, as well as uh, between different pages within our, our web app itself. And, you know, we, we've sort of got to the end of this and, and our, our prototype's really ready to go. We're really ready to push it out there in the world and that's gonna happen over the next couple weeks. Um, and, and we started asking ourselves a question, you know, with any good sort of, um, you know, build process, you start to talk about, okay, what went right, what went wrong? Um, and we asked our question, ourselves the question, you know, now do we want to build a native app? And honestly, the resounding answer is like, oh, definitely not. Like, now we're talking about actually using it, uh, progressive web apps, as we start to think about what that experience is going to be for our hotel chain. If you guys don't know, West Elm is starting a, a hotel chain in 2018. Um, and we're talking about how can we actually bring progressive web apps to that experience. So instead of uh, creating a native application as you standard would for uh, a, a hotel, um, we're actually considering how to do that with a progressive web app. And we really do believe that this progressive web app can be the bridge between the traditional mobile web and sort of how it was, you know, even up till now, but year, you know, a year or two ago, and the current native application landscape. Um, and really, again, and I, I hate to belabor this point, but really, why, we're, why I'm up here and why I'm so excited about this, if you can't tell, I, I get a little passionate about this stuff in general, is that we, this, is, this is the future of the mobile web. This is what a browsing experience should be. And the reason that Alex and I are up here is we share a very, um, I think, similar goal uh, in our work, which is how do we make the experience on someone's device, be it their desktop, be it their mobile, the best experience they can be, so that they, they not only get enjoyment out of that, but they also great, get great brand awareness and they have a positive feeling when they're done with that experience. And so all of that comes together with the Progressive Web App because you can do that, but then again, you can also have that discoverability, that searchability. We're going to show up in all of our great SEO results as we want to, and we can get new clients. We're not just targeting the loyalists who have actually taken the time to download our app. And our next steps for us really, we're, we're moving forward with a variety of, of, of further sort of enhancements. Uh, we're working on a push notification strategy, which is something I remember doing like in my first native app years and years ago. Uh, it almost feels a little bit new because I think we have to really actually rethink how we handle push notifications on the web. It's a different user experience. It's a different user. You don't have that same uh, probably um, you know, handhold that you did with a native application where you knew you were making a really intense sort of uh, commitment to that brand. Um, and so we're thinking through that. We're also thinking through our integrations with, with AMP, which is Accelerated Mobile Pages, um, and how those we can build those for our product pages. So not only does our site load fast, but when you click in, uh, into our product page from a search result, it loads instantaneously. 
And then there's also some really great um, checkout APIs and sign-in APIs that continue to reduce the friction of typing on a mobile device. And we think integrating those into our solution and into our progressive web app is, is not is gonna only enhance the capabilities, the usabilities, and of course the customer satisfaction that comes along with that. And so with that, I, I, I'd like to thank everybody. I really appreciate your time to let like two sort of tech nerds come and uh, dork out a little bit uh, around, around digital and technology. And, and I also wanna thank you guys for the opportunity to sort of, um, as Alex said, cross-pollinate and discuss the ways in the worlds where not only is digital intersecting with retail, but that retail is influencing and intersecting with digital as well. And so with that, I think we've got a little bit of time for some questions if people want to ask. Yeah. Don't be shy. Hi there. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Hey, um, uh, I was really interested in your um, comment about, uh, gee, we've got to slow things down. So the um, first thing that pops into mind is, build in some kind of positive feedback when those changes happen so it doesn't happen so quickly that people aren't sure if it's working properly. So that's my, that's my, my thought there. But um, when it comes to um, uh, 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 the, the, uh, uh, the add to home screen function, is it always just add this site to the home screen or is there an option to add this particular page or item in the site to my home screen so I can return to it again later. So we actually had functionality in Chrome for uh, many years that allowed users to go into the overflow menu and add to home screen. And that behavior is actually slightly different because in those contexts, it would be basically a bookmark to that particular page that you were viewing. But with this, the expectation of users is much more of an app-like experience where they expect to come into the start of the experience. And so when you see that banner, that is specifically um, uh, sort of from the start. One thing I should say as well is we actually tested you having that, that banner say install because the experience after users install it or add it to their home screen, a lot of users forget. Is it a web app? Is it a native app? I don't care as a user. And all I care is I'm interacting with West Elm. And we actually found that it tested worse. And part of the reason is because users know that installing is a heavyweight action. And add to home screen feels lighter, which is much closer to what it really is in this case. Yeah, and I, and I'll, I mean, I'll also echo too, I, I think that you know, we're at a little bit of a, uh, obviously a new shift here with add to home screen and what that can do, but I do think that it is a, an integration with your entire capability, your entire site, your entire retail experience. And I think you're even gonna, you're not gonna want people just to bookmark that for a specific product or a specific category. You're gonna bring them into that top of the funnel as you normally would anyone who experiences your brand and, and comes to that brand in a meaningful way. Hi there. Um, great presentation, and I you know, appreciate all the things that you guys are doing from a mobile perspective. But thinking a little bit about the theme of the conference and the, the store element, knowing that you know, there's stores, and you mentioned hotels, and the whole uh, you know, customer experience, can you talk a little bit about how you've designed this to really hit the customer, whether they are on the mobile app or maybe you know, are near a store or want to go into a store, and how you've been able to design the site for customers that either want to shop online or actually go into a store? Yeah, um, I, I, there's a lot, that's a good question. There's a lot there, and it's actually something we're really thinking about. Um, at West Elm, we've got you know, something like 100 stores uh, now, and, and actually that number is gonna continue to grow. And one of the biggest things that we're, we wanna do with the mobile site and the work that we're doing around mobile is also drive traffic. Um, one of the great things is that you can start thinking about push notifications, uh, presenting either opportunities, classes, offers, specifically while someone is actually in the location or around your store, uh, based off of whatever browsing history and information you have around that user, uh, specifically through push notifications and, and progressive web apps. But the other thing we wanna do is we wanted to create a really robust in-store experience as well. So a lot of the things that we're talking about right now are actually um, how to flip or change uh, the current application to be different dependent on location or the whereabouts that we know you're at. So we think right now we've sort of replicated that current experience, which is you have a really good search, a really good navigation, really good browse capability, and that, you know, that's great in store, you want that. Um, but a lot of the things that we talk about around hotel and around, uh, around retail itself is how do we change that experience so that it's unique to that store, to that environment, and to the place that you're at. That's a huge question, in my opinion, for hotels and something we're really thinking about. 
about because of a, a lot of the areas we're going into are very local focused and are very, um, they're very much driven by the area that's right around them. Mm -hmm. We wanna make sure that your experience while you're thinking about booking at West Ham Hotels is, is obviously very booking focused, but when you're actually in that hotel or in Detroit or wherever you are with that hotel, you actually get a completely unique experience. So I, I think we're, we're really at the baseline right now of what we can do and how we're gonna approach that, but that's, there's a, a massive place and, and progressive web apps are really gonna help to sort of um, accelerate that based on a lot of the capabilities they allow us to do. One thing I think is important as well is um, if you have these brilliant in-store experiences where people can have uh, scan and check themselves out and what, whatnot, that to some extent if it's an app presumes that they've already installed the app before they get to the store. Right. And your most <laughs> engaged users hopefully will have done that, but not everybody will have. And one thing we found in, in practice is that when people are in the store, especially a, a big thing, there's lots of uh, racks and stuff, it's actually the, one of the worst times for someone to download an app. And so if you have something that works really well where they can just uh, go to a, qu a quick URL or whatever and then do that behavior right there without installing it before they got there, that's pretty powerful. And that's something that progressive web apps and web apps in general are just a really good uh, fit for, I think. 